afternoon, Chair. Your meeting's now live. Thank you, Peter. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Councillor Ben Dowling. I'm the Chair of this Employment Committee, and this is the first time we've formally met as a virtual committee. Um, and just as a reminder, this meeting is being broadcast um, to enable press and public to view the meeting. Uh, so a bit of admin first. I'm just going to read out a little brief uh, based on the current circumstances. We're meeting virtually in response to the limitations placed on governance by the COVID-19 pandemic. For the purposes of this meeting, the City Solicitor has advised that pursuant to Section 78 of the Coronavirus Act 2020, this meeting will be run by reference to the model standing orders as set out in the local authorities brackets coronavirus flexibility of local authority meetings regulations 2020 number 392. I hope everyone got that. Um, as with all virtual meetings, can I just remind everyone to please have their microphones off when not speaking uh, to avoid feedback and background noise, etc. We will start by doing a quick round robin of who is on the call. Um, I'm not fussed about whether we do it in a particular order, so I will call out names based on the order they're appearing on my participants list on li excuse me participants list on Teams. Um, starting with myself, uh, Ben Dowling, Chair of Employment Committee. Uh, next, I have uh, Councillor Atkins, very aptly timed arrival. Matt, welcome. We'll come back to you in a, in a bit for an introduction. Can I get Katie, please? Hi, I'm Katie Bell. I'm the new Health and Safety Manager working for Meredith Hughes. Welcome, Katie. I think this is your first formal committee as well, so it nice is. to have you. Thank you. Uh, Just starting week three. <laughs> wonderful. Uh, Councillor Corkery. Cal Corkery, Councillor for Charles Dickens Ward. Uh, whoever is signed in as Democratic Services, I'm assuming that's Peter. Uh, Democratic Services is the web streaming account. Okay, brilliant. Uh, Natasha? I can't stop, I've been a meeting at the moment. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Natasha Edmonds, Director of Corporate Services. Uh, Mered? Good afternoon, everyone. Meredith Hughes, Assistant Director for Buildings. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Thank you, uh, Councillor Donna Jones, Conservative Group Leader. Thank you, Rochelle. Uh, Rochelle Nella, Assistant Director of HR, reporting to Natasha Evans. Thank you, uh, Sue Page. Uh, Sue Page, Finance. Thank you, uh, Vicky. Vicky Fleet has Democratic Services, present chair. Thank you. Councillor Sanders. Uh, Darren Sanders, councillor for Baffins Ward. Thank you. Uh, Peter Smith Parkin. Yes, Peter Smith Parkin supporting the web streaming process. Thank you. Sean Tetley. Hi, Sean Tetley, payroll and pension manager at the council. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, councillor Vernon Jackson. Uh, Councillor Gerald Vernon Jackson, uh, leader of the council. And David Williams. Good afternoon, David Williams, Chief Executive. Thank you. And we'll cycle back to Councillor Atkins, who has now joined us. Uh, yeah, Councillor Matt Atkins, Cosham and Wimmering Wood. Thanks. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, we have three written deputations and I've spoken to Vicky about it and unless there are any uh, ulterior um, alternate suggestions I've said that we'll read out the written deputations in reference to each uh, item when we reach that item rather than hearing everything at the front and then hoping we remember what they've said by the time we get to the agenda item uh, and they are one in reference to item six, reward and reconciliation uh, recognition, and that's from Unite the Union. And we've had two in relation to item eight, foundation living wage, one from Sue Melman on behalf of Hampshire Equalities Group, and one again from Unite the Union. Uh, these have all been circulated to everyone in advance. Okay, on to the main agenda. Um, apologies for absence. I believe we are all here. Is that correct, Vicky? That's correct, Chair. 
Wonderful. Uh, does anyone have any declarations of interest that they need to declare separate to uh, anything else they've already done? Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. I okay. Oh, go on, Ben. I have Cal's hand raised. Uh, apologies, I missed it. Councillor Corkery. Thank you, Chair. It was actually in relation to the previous um, item discussion around deputations. Just yeah. a query, really, about if any progress is being made towards allowing people to give deputations on the call. Because um, I know that, that kind of feedback has been provided to me in relation to this meeting specifically, but I guess it's a general point that people would prefer to do it and have the interaction as part of the call rather than it be um, written in advance. No, I think that's helpful, Councillor. Um, Vicky slash Peter, do you have an update for us? I think David Williams, um, as Chief Executive, has a paper that is going to group leaders um, and will be addressing it to group leaders tomorrow. Okay, wonderful. Uh, David is nodding his head. Is that sufficient, Cal? Uh, Councillor Corkery? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, minutes to the last meeting. Um, are we happy with these? I believe Vicky was saying there's only three of us here that were at that meeting, myself, Councillor Corker and Councillor Sanders. I'm broadly happy with them. I, any issues, Councillors? No? Great. Shaking of heads. Wonderful. We'll take those as approved. Okay, on to the main items. Um, trade union facilities time. I believe, Rochelle, you're going to present this for us? Um, Chairman, I've raised my hand. Um, I don't know yeah. if you can see electronic. No, I can, I can. I'm just multitasking, leader. I, I know, some of us find it easier to do than others. Um, uh, uh, can I ask if it's possible to vary the order of the agenda so that once we've done trade union facilities time, uh, we do the um, living wage paper as it's something I've pushed on for many years, but I don't want to miss it if I have to go to hospital appointment. Uh, I'm amenable to that suggestion unless anyone has a significant issue with it. I'm not getting any dissent, in which case we will do that. So if we could do a uh, varied agenda in that way in order to do the trade union facility time followed by living wage and then we'll return to the remaining gender items as written. Um, I think that would be sensible. Over to you, Rochelle. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is the trade union facilities reporting. This is a statutory requirement for us to report this annually and we've been doing so since 2017. So you're probably well versed at the, the data in that, so I won't go into a huge amount of detail. What should be noted is the reference period is from the 1st of April 2019 until the 31st of March 2020. So it doesn't yet take account of a member's previous decision to increase the funding for trade unions. So we expect to see that um, impact next year on the next year's reporting. So just a few points to note. Um, there has been a reduction in the number of trade union officials um, since the last um, reporting. Ben. Um, I think we were talking about the living wage. I mean, Rochelle is talking, I think, about trades union facilities work. Have I got no, that wrong, my, Rochelle? My proposal was that we did living wage after. Uh, sorry, trade. my fault. So carry on. Thank you, Rochelle. Um, Continue. No problem. It will be quick anyway. Um, the trade union, so we've reduced from 16 officials um, to 14. There's been a, a slight increase um, in the overall um, costing of the trade union. Um, sorry, reduction, slight reduction in the total costing. But again, we are expecting to see that increase as the trade unions um, have increased their allocation of time based on the funding. Um, I won't go into all of the statistics. I'll just take questions. I can see the hands raised anyway, so I'll, I'll start with those. Wonderful. Thank you, Rochelle. Sorry. Um, Let's go for Councillor Sanders, followed by Councillor Corkery. Thanks, Ben. Um, Rochelle, the, um, I may have asked this, I think I asked this last year. We've got lots of trades unionists who are working on the average of 7%, I think it is, of their time. We're lots working at 3 and 4, and yet they're all bundled into a bit of 1 to 50%, which seems 
misleading to say the least because that gives the impression of trades unions are doing more than they actually are which i think is wrong um is there some way we can vary the table legally to maybe into deciles and stuff like that so it actually reflects the time the percentage of time that trades unions are doing uh, because we don't want people to think they're doing more than they are the report format is set for us because it's statutory reporting so that's the way that we need to publish it and that's the way that we need to produce it and um, for the government return what we have provided is a short narrative underneath to give a breakdown for members um, to give you a clear indication but what we could do for next year is in our employment committee report provide members with the breakdown but keep the statutory reporting as is would that be more helpful um, if there's no if, if there is no legal way we can do it this year then it was going to have to be but my preference would be it's this year because I, I just think lots of people those who are interested will probably say oh god the trade union is doing all 50 percent isn't this disgraceful well we actually it seems to be that. much more efficient use of their time that. Yeah, there's no reason why we can't give that breakdown for the minutes if everybody's happy for that to be included. The data is available. It's just the statutory report that's yeah, uploaded. Yeah, I, I, personally, I would be, but I'll leave it in the hands of colleagues. <laughs> Rochelle, that seems like a sensible way forward. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Corkery. Thank you. In terms of trade union secondment funding, I know that this administration gave a commitment um, around the time of the budget earlier this year to, to reinstate that level of funding to, to previous levels before it was cut. I just wondered if any progress had been made towards that. Yes, it's the simple answer. Yes, um, as far as we were, the trade unions were tasked with coming back to us as to how they wanted to allocate that, and um, it was significantly over budget for the first one, um, but we resolved that. And there was one outstanding issue in Unison where we were trying to negotiate with a manager the um, release of a, a specific individual, and we were unable to come to an agreement over that. But my emails this morning tell me that has now been resolved, and there's another individual who will be filling that gap. So as far as I am aware, um, that is all now resolved. Brilliant. Thank you both. Uh, Cal, did you have something further or you've left your hand up? One no, I've just left okay. my hand up. Please. That's okay, we're all still getting used to things. Um, unless there are any further comments or questions, I think this report is just to note, um, and I'm happy for us to note it, uh, and to note the data within it. Any other queries from any one members? Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Um, let's approve those as um, as recommended in the agenda. Uh, okay, moving on to the foundation living wage as per our agreement to vary the agenda. If we could do an introduction from the relevant officer followed by the reading out of the written deputation we've had in respect to that item, that would be really helpful. Over to whomever is introducing. Hi Ben, I've been asked to introduce but hand over to Natasha because it's kind of it's a bit of a broad range report for this one. So if we can do That's that, good. then we like teamwork. That's good. <laughs> We're very good at it. Um, so just to reaffirm the position from Forza City Council's perspective, we have already confirmed our commitment to paying all of our directly employed staff and agency workers um, in in the internal agency the foundation living wage. In the March committee meeting, uh, members tasked us with exploring the possibility of becoming accredited. To become an accredited um, employer, that involves all of our contractors paying their staff and their subcontractors the foundation living wage um, and the likelihood of those costs being passed on to us. So we didn't progress with that as quickly as we would have wanted to because the pandemic struck soon after. But I will hand over to Natasha as she's been linking in with procurement and finance around that piece of work to move forward. OK. Thank you, Rochelle. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, so the, we've done some initial work from a procurement point of view because we need to understand what um, what 
what contracts we have that would be in scope um, as part of the requirement for accreditation. And from that, we've identified in excess of 650 contracts that we would then need to assess um, and understand what um, what the financial impact would be. Now, the likelihood um, is that any increase in costs within those contracts would be passed back to the council. Um, so just by way of an example, the uplift just, uh, you know, just across uh, residential and domiciliary care contracts is in, is is sort of around about two million pounds. Um, so we'd need to do that detailed piece of work, um, which was very good, likely going to involve contacting each of those uh, suppliers. Um, again in excess of 650 of them, um, just to understand exactly what uh, the implications would be. Now, the, um, we'd need to do that piece of work to, to, to do the financial assessment and impact on us. Um, the then subsequent steps would then be to um, apply any change from a, an accreditation point of view at the point of contract renewal or retender. So it, that there wouldn't be an immediate effect, um, but we would do this over a period of years as and when those contracts come to be renewed. Um, at the moment, our contracts are typically awarded on a standard term of three years, plus the option to extend for a further two. Uh, but we have more recently been moving to um, sort of a base term of five years on our contracts, particularly the higher value contracts. Um, and then, of course, we also have the PFI contracts, which are much longer term um, and therefore quite difficult to negotiate on the cost base. Um, financial implications, therefore, are at this stage unknown. But from the initial assessment that we know of in terms of what I've just um, d d mentioned in terms of uh, domiciliary care and residential care, they are likely to be substantial. So we would need to undertake that work initially and then come back um, because there would be a budget implication and therefore any decisions around this would therefore also need to be taken as part of the budget process at um, full council. Um, However, I would caveat all of that with saying that in terms of engaging with our supply chain and with the majority of this impact being in the adult social care sector, um, the timing at the moment is probably one where both council services and those in our supply chain are very much focused on dealing with the current pandemic and may not have the capacity to respond to any inquiries that we have um, in relation to uh, a foundation living wage accreditation. Under uh, normal, whatever normal circumstances uh, will be going forward, it, um, the, the foundation has said it typically takes around about three years or so to gain accreditation. We could be looking at three years, maybe slightly longer, if we were to go down that road at, at this point in time. But, but I would suggest that we, uh, as the recommendation set out, do an initial piece of work to understand fully the financial implications. Okay, thank you very much both. I think that's a really helpful introduction and overview. Um, Vicky, would you be able to read the deputations we've had? Certainly. Um, from you, Unite the Union, Foundation Living Wage Accreditation. The introduction of the Foundation Living Wage in June 2018 was a welcome step, particularly after the previous administration had shamefully imposed a pay freeze of the lowest paid in PCC's employment. While agreeing to pay PCC staff the Foundation Living Wage, Councillor Vernon Jackson also made a commitment to work towards full accreditation with the Living Wage Foundation. This report illustrates the lack of action since this commitment was made and seems to be making the case for a further period of feet dragging. Noting the steps that need to be taken to achieve accreditation is not enough. Action is what is needed. The first step should be to form an internal working group, open brackets 5.1.3, close brackets, to look at this issue and ensure progress is being made. We would also hope that a report from the working group is included as a standing item, both at the Joint Officer Staff Forum and future Employment Committee meetings. If neighbouring authorities have been able to implement and maintain accreditation, we see no reason why it can't be achieved in Portsmouth. And the second deputation is from Sue Mullen on behalf of the Hampshire Equality Group, COVID-19 Recovery Plans. 
recommendations for local authorities and local enterprise partnerships. In order to ensure that the recovery is built on foundations that deal with the damaging effects of income and wealth inequality, we recommend the following objectives are built into recovery plans. One, implement and champion the real living wage. Pay all directly contracted staff the real living wage as set by the Living Wage Foundation in line with 118 other local authorities. Ensure all council contractors are required to pay staff the real living wage as a condition of their contracts with the LA. Act as an ambassador for the real living wage and promote it to local employers. Two, implement the public sector duty regarding socio-economic inequalities. While there is not yet a legal requirement to implement Section 1 of the Equality Act 2010, to do so would be of great importance to reduce inequality. Some councils, such as Newcastle City, are already implementing this, as is the Scottish Government. Section 1 states, an authority to which this section applies must, when making decisions of a strategic nature about how to exercise its functions, have due regard to the desirability of exercising them in a way that is designed to reduce the inequalities of outcome which result from socio-economic disadvantage. Three, support local initiatives that tackle inequality. Support local charities through direct funding and involvement in the implementation of COVID-19 strategies. Publish and pursue active strategies to tackle local food, fuel and funeral poverty support local organisations which actively tackle financial exclusion through information, advice, affordable lending, etc. That's the end of the deputations. Thank you for that, Vicky. Um, I can see everyone is keen to speak on this gender item. Uh, I'm going to go with the order on my screen, so we'll start with the leader. Um, thank you. Thanks, Chair, um, and, and, and thank you for the report. Um, I, I think I would very much agree with the deputation from Unite uh, on this. I think um, the Council has been clear that the objective is that we become a, um, a living wage uh, employer, not just directly um, to the people who work for the City Council, but indirectly people on contract. Um, I think we need a, a group to work on this specifically. Um, is a sensible thing. Uh, I, I have to say I'm slightly disappointed with the report. Um, I'd have thought uh, it would have been fairly simple to contact every um, organisation to which we have a contract um, uh, to ask them what would be the real effect of um, moving to um, the living wage for, um, for everybody who's involved in the contract um, being paid for by Portsmouth City Council. Uh, and I hope that that work could happen fairly quickly. It doesn't seem to me a particularly difficult piece of work. And in some ways, we're faced with a report with lots of um, suppositions and guesswork because that's not happened. Um, so I hope that we're able to move forward um, as a council quickly, um, that we can look to, to be able to get real ideas about the real cost so that we can make real decisions. Um, and I hope that that can be taken forward. But I think that the direction of travel must be clear that the, the objective is to be a living wage accredited employer and that everybody um, who is being paid for through their wages, either directly or indirectly, receives a living wage. It's called a living wage for a reason. It's a wage upon which people can live. And that's what we need to be getting to. Thank you, Leader. Um, Vicky, just a point of clarification. Um, given the end result of where we look like we're heading towards will require full council and cabinet decision making, how far can this go in the realms of employment committee asking for work to be done before it's no longer something that we can request to be done and it's something that cabinets have to pick up? Um, well, you are you're being asked today to note this report um, and so that's really what you can do and then we can take it forward through cabinet and then onto council should that be the, the route we'll have to we'll have to decide the route outside this meeting I think okay so should there be a will to for example set up a working group to 
to get towards accreditation. That's not something we could mandate. We would have to make a recommendation towards Cabinet to, to mandate that to happen. You can make a recommendation today to say that the Employment, rec the employment Committee recommends that Cabinet looks into whatever you want them to do, um, and yeah. then they can take it forward. I think that's what the Employment Committee can do today. Yeah, but we would be reasonable, should Cabinet then decide to take it forward, we would be reasonable to ask for updates on that work, given that it relates di so directly. Okay, oh, yeah. that's really helpful. Um, next on my list, I have Councillor Atkins. Thanks, uh, Chair. Um, with respect, I, I have to disagree with the, the leader of the council. I, I thought this was a good report um, because I think essentially what it's clearly saying is that at the moment this is not an easy piece of work to do because um, a lot of our contractors and a lot of the council staff are busy dealing with the issues raised by COVID and particularly in the more expensive and difficult uh, care sectors. I think we also have to remember that there's a good chance that a number of our departments um, are going to be in budget shortfall already as a result of the COVID crisis. And what the report also makes clear is is that the becoming fully accredited by paying all our, ensuring all our subcontractors pay the um, the, the foundational living wage is not affordable for the council at the moment. So I, I, I just really question what is the value in doing a difficult piece of um, work at the moment, which is contacting 650 contractors who are currently busy dealing with their own problems, which is um, the, the COVID issue, um, to, to get them to attempt to calculate how much extra they would charge the council if we were paying the, the foundation living wage, when in fact um, we're ultimately going to come to the conclusion we can't actually afford it at the moment, most likely, because not only does it impose costs that we, we know we can't cover at the moment in departments, we likely have departments which are already in shortfall as a result of COVID. I mean, even if the, I mean, the, the leader suggested that, well, the report is based on the estimates and suppositions. Well, even if the the um, the supposition on adult social care was 50% out and it was only going to uplift the cost by £1 million, pounds, well, we just plugged in the budget this year a £1.8 million budget shortfall in adult social care by um, raising council tax. We're going to be looking at a, a, a referendum on council tax if we want to actually achieve what we're talking about, going back over all our our, um, our old contracts. The only real way forward that I can see is going to be if you want to in future sign up to contracts that meet the foundation level wage, we could gradually transition. But the idea that we're going to have the money in the current circumstances to go and renegotiate all these contracts simply seems to me... Um, fantasy. I mean, I, I can see why the aspiration is there. I'm not saying it's not a good aspiration. I'm saying we know what's going on in the council at the moment. We know what's going on with our contractors, and we're not going to have the money. Why, why do this in quite large, quite difficult piece of work in the current circumstances when we know that it's not actually at this time going to lead anywhere? Um, and I think also, to some extent, the problem is being gradually resolved by the increases in minimum wage that are being made nationally. I think it should be noted that... Um, the national living wage, I know confusing the um, the, the nomenclature, if you like, the, the naming, um, the, is, is uh, to be it's, uh, debated whether or not it is reaching uh, minimum, uh, living wage standards, but the living wage has been pushed up by the fact that the government has chosen to increase the, the legal minimum wage. So I, I do think that as that escalator it reaches its top of the, the national living wage that the government has instituted, actually this is a, a less live issue than it was and in the present time with, with council budgets so under pressure when it's clear from the report that we will not in the short term be able to afford to actually achieve foundation living wage accreditation, uh, why push for this piece of work? Why not take the more sensible approach of, well, can we do this with our contracts going forward as they come up for renewal? Why, why attempt to go back over them and renegotiate them um, when we know we don't really have the money? Uh, th that's my uh, thoughts on it, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. And just for some clarification, um, Natasha and Rochelle, my understanding is that accreditation can be given so long as there is a clear roadmap towards ensuring those contracts get renegotiated and can be done on renewal. It's not a you have to do this overnight in order to get the accreditation. Is that that's correct? correct is my understanding. That is correct. Yes. Okay, that's just a helpful piece of information. Uh, Councillor Corkery. Thank you, Chair. 
I'd like to start by thanking um, the Hampshire Quality Group and United Union for submitting their helpful deputations on this issue. I think it's important that we do that. I think it's important that we try and encourage as much kind of wider residents and community engagement in council business wherever possible. I think the, the need for the living wage has been, it's been clearly kind of identified and hopefully there's some consensus on it today. I know this is something that I, I've kind of brought up multiple times um, been elected in this forum and then also at the last full council meeting where there was a motion on staff pay and a, a, one of the clear resolutions from that was to commit the council to pay the living wage. So it has already been to that forum and kind of received approval in it. I, I think... It, <laughs> more so than ever now we should realise the importance of the living wage and I think there's some discussion about whether now is the right time to be pursuing this as a fourth action whether it should be treated as a priority I mean my argument my response to that would be that now is exactly the right time now after we've seen what six months of social care workers in Portsmouth and elsewhere on zero hour contracts going out kind of day in day out really really putting their lives on the line sometimes losing their lives as a result and some of them are not even being paid the living wage. I think it's an absolute disgrace and I think it should be the absolute priority of elected representatives wherever they serve and local authorities wherever they are to be pushing this through our structures as an absolute top priority and ensuring it's implemented as soon as possible. I also wanted to pick up on the point that um, you just made chair because I think that's exactly right. Come accredited is not re requiring you to be at that moment in time, straight away, per ensuring that all contracted workers are receiving living wage. It's about having a plan uh, about moving towards that, and that's clearly set out in Appendix 2, the document which is in from the Living Wage Foundation that sets out the various steps um, that need to be achieved in order to become an accredited living wage employer. And Step 2, making a plan for procurement, uh, clearly talks about having target dates for implementation and plans of working towards that with contractors. So I, I don't think whether or not it is affordable right now at this moment in time should be a barrier to us pushing this forward um, and becoming accredited as soon as possible. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Also, Corey. sorry, I've got a couple more points okay. there. Um, in terms of the recommendations in the report, uh, I'd like to suggest to add something to those recommendations. Oh, sorry, Councillor Corker, you're you're breaking up a bit. I think you're moving mic around. Oh, or... Yeah, I've got two screens. I'm facing the other one. I'll try and face this one. Um, in terms of the recommendations, I think that we need to add something to them. I think, f first off, they're not actually doing anything um, substantial. So I think we need to kind of beat them up a bit. But also, kind of equally as importantly, they're all negative. So, so apart from the first one, which is about... Um, noting the requirements associated to become a living wage employer. The, the, the three subsequent recommendations are all points about why we shouldn't do it or how costly it's going to be. And I think apart from anything else, that just doesn't strike the right tone. We need to be putting forward the message in there that we are, we are committed to do this. This is a priority. And actually, it's really important for lots of people in Portsmouth that we do that. And so in terms of concrete suggestions, one of the recommendations that I think we should put in there is around the working group. Um, so that it's a kind of more substantial um, resolutions um, and wh whether we can form that working group or not I guess it's something to be discussed but I'm sure we can recommend to cabinet um, that that happens so I'd like to put that on the table and also the point, the suggestion that was made around having a standing agenda item I think that can probably also be put in there so that we have a standing agenda item to every employment committee meeting um, it, until we become an accredited living wage employer and I guess also out past that to look at where, where we're doing in terms of the plan for implementation and um, to achieve the goal of everyone receiving a living wage in contracted services. So I'd like to yeah, suggest that those two bits are put into the recommendations, please, Chair. Okay, thank you, Councillor Corkery. I think it's really helpful. Um, if we allow Councillors Jones and Sanders to uh, have their say first and then we'll come to looking at uh, where we stand on the recommendations and, and ways forward, but I personally, I'm certainly uh, on a similar page to yourself. Uh, Councillor Jones. 
Thank you very much, Chair. Um, well, I'm going to start at the bottom because then the only way is up. Um, and I'm going to start with the comments from Unite, the union, uh, who have made an incorrect statement in their deputation today by saying that the previous administration, that was the Conservative one, unsurprisingly, um, uh, implemented a pay freeze for people paid the lowest amount in the organisation, when in fact the absolute opposite is true. Um, and in fact, there was a year, uh, for, if my memory serves me correctly, when in fact it was the lowest paid in the organisations were the only ones that got, or they were the ones that got the largest percentage um, increase. Um, when the government introduced the living wage um, and introduced, increased the tariff of the living wage, um, we uh, duly uh, applied that. We didn't stick with the minimum wage, we went with the living wage. Uh, obviously, the living wage foundation is a wholly different thing again, um, and we did consider this back in 20. I think it was 2016 or 2017. Um, and the reason that we didn't implement it at that point is exactly the reason why uh, there is not a proposal for the Liberal Democrats um, and, and the Liberal Democrat chair of this committee to propose that to us today from officers. I actually think the report is excellent. Um, I think it would be wholly um, inappropriate and irresponsible of officers to uh, have brought a recommendation to implement this today um, in the current economic climate. I'm pretty sure that our Section 151 officer and even possibly our chief executive would have something to say about that. Um, the government have planned uh, how they want to increase um, you know, the, the, the amount of money that those that are paid the lowest in society are, are paid um, in a stepped increment with how they are projecting the economy will grow and change over the next few years. And as we are an organisation funded wholly by government, um, aside from our council tax, uh, then, you know, it, it makes sense for us to be in line with the government in what they are trying to achieve. Now, you know, I think that the report on the table today and that report that faced me when I was chair of this committee going back three or four years ago when I considered this first time, is no different. And I suspect the outcome today between what was then the Conservative-led administration of this council and the current Liberal Democrat administration will be no different. Um, however, honesty is probably the main difference in that I was honest and said, this is not something that we can afford to do right now at the tail end of an austerity programme. Um, whereas you currently have the leader of the council making comments that uh, he would very much like to do this. Well, he absolutely has the ability to do this, as Councillor Corkery has, has said a moment ago. If Councillor Vernon Jackson is serious about implementing uh, and joining the Living Wage Foundation and, and ensuring that all of our contractors and anyone in our organisation directly employed directly or indirectly is paid that amount of money, he needs to put his money where his mouth is and put the two million quid aside in the budget in February. And yes, between now and then, if the if the go ahead is given, then officers can start, you know, bottoming out some of those guesstimations of two million quid. It might come out at one point eight million. It might, however, come back at two point two million. But at least if some money is put in the budget by the Liberal Democrats in February, and that's what they really, really want to do, if they're really serious about it, that's what I think they should be doing. But all of this dancing around and trying to blame officers, I think, is highly political and completely inappropriate. Um, so, yeah, from my perspective, um, I've calculated it would cost about £25 per household across the city to bring in a £2 million increase for a pay rise to uh, the staff in the organisation paid the lowest. Um, my personal position on this is that it now is not the right time to do that, particularly when we could be looking at as many as three or four million unemployed across the country next year. Um, but I think the report is good. Uh, I support the recommendations as they are. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, I think that it's, it's sensible to keep this item on the agenda and to keep reviewing it, if nothing else, to hold the Leader of the Council to account. Okay, thank you, Councillor Jones, for that impassioned contribution to the meeting. Uh, Councillor Sanders. Thank you. Um, I've also been on this committee for about four, five, six years now, and I remember when the, uh, the Portsmouth living wage, as it was described, was frozen at £7.85 for more than 12 months. I said then I thought that was bad. I still think that was bad um, because that means that the lowest paid in this authority did not get a pay rise. I think that's bad. Um, I think one of the best things that we've done as an administration is actually honour our commitments to bring in directly employed staff onto the living wage, the, the real living wage, not because um, it, but because it's the right, because the right thing to do, and because we need poverty, we need to tackle poverty pay. 
Um, so we're faced with this situation. And I think one of the weaknesses of the report is actually Rochelle's presentation encourages us to go further. There seems to be a consensus around trying to establish some sort of working group to see if we can, uh, we can, begi we can begin the process of seeing if we can go towards accreditation. I don't see how with a, I mean, I'm one of the portfolio holders is facing a shortfall. I've encouraged uh, not just staff, but also contractors to see if they can get, they can be paid the real living wage. I chair the Langston Harbour Board and I've got seasonal and patrol officers paid the living wage, the real living wage for the first time ever. So I know that if it's financially doable, it can be done. We have a 14 million pound budget shortfall and we have to deal with that. Um, and that's why I think the most sensible way forwards is actually to, and I'll, if I may, Cal, I will, I'll try and put a, try and put a form of words together to sort of put some flesh on the bones of what you're saying. Because I think it is actually what the officers are suggesting as well. Uh, which is, and Vicky, correct me if I'm wrong, if I've got the, the, if I get the four wrong or what we need to do, please tell me. And that is to recommend to cabinet and this is recommendation five, I wish to add, and that is to recommend to Cabinet that a working group is established to see how and what the timetable is for becoming an accredited living wage employer. And I think that's short, I think that's sensible, I think it's entirely in line with the presentation that Rochelle has given because and, and Natasha has given because they're talking about going to contractors and asking them. It also recognises that we can't do it overnight um, and I don't think we should do it overnight uh, but I think we have to be clear about a direction of travel whilst being realistic that there is no way in the universe with a £14 million budget gap we're going to do it now. So I put forward that as a fifth recommendation and uh, ask for seconders, please. Thanks, Ben. Okay, before we take comments, is there a clear seconder for Councillor Sanders? Okay, Councillor Vern Jackson, thank you. Um, we will continue to comments and we'll vote on each recommendation one by one, I think is the best way forward, given I'm sure there'll be a slight difference of viewpoint on some of them. Uh, Councillor I'd Jones. Sorry, um, I was trying to indicate I'd like to add um, another addendum to Councillor Sanders' um, proposal, which I think is a good idea. Like, I, you know, I've made my position clear on whether or not I think this council should be doing this at this stage. However, if this is what the administration is saying they want to do, I think the working group is a very good idea. Let's meet as often as we possibly can. Let's get through the work. Uh, let's make sure we know what the exact numbers are. So there's no more excuses that can be made. Um, I would like to add to Councillor Sanders' um, amendment to the recommendations that a conclusion at the very least is reached by January 2020 in time for the budget for Jan February 2021 so that this doesn't get kicked into the next financial year because that will then get used as the as the next excuse. Um, I also uh, wanted to come back and say that actually we did not um, freeze. Councillor Sanders made an inaccurate statement when he said that the previous administration actually uh, put a freeze on pay at £7.85. In fact, we increased that wage from 7 50 to 7 85 We did not freeze it, we increased it. And by the time we stopped being the administration, nobody in the organisation was being paid under £8.00. 8.21 an hour, something along those lines. So I think it's very important that, particularly for external people who may be watching this, or members of staff, that the correct information is giving out and we make sure that whilst we might have our political agendas, um, we try to not uh, give um, misinformation to uh, people who could be watching. Thank you, Councillor Jones. I think I think your perspective, Councillor Sanders' perspective and the union's perspective on, on previous pay has is clear for anyone to watch um, and I think that's fair. Uh, Councillor Van Jackson uh, Thank you Chair <clears throat> I think this proposal is very sensible um, and, uh, and, and we should go forward. I, I think though just for the record um, there are as I understand it <clears throat> a couple of months ago when I asked this question 122 people whose pay was frozen under the previous administration. So while the chief executive and other very highly paid council officials got 
pay rises. Their 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 pay was frozen, um, uh, and they were the very poorest people. They were um, domestic assistants, uh, passenger assistants, cleaning operatives, uh, grounds maintenance, security. Um, 122 of them are still employed by the council, and somebody appears to be doing building work. Um, so uh, I've um, in the background, um, but but their pay was frozen, and each of those people on the very very lowest wages lost 570 pounds per person. Um, and I think the difference between the administrations is there is a clear signal here that not only have we um, achieved our commitment to um, pay people the living wage, but we're working through how we do that to all the contractors as well. And and that is a piece of work that has to be done because we need to do it. And there is a clear difference um, with all these 122 employees who had their pay frozen because they were on the lowest uh, wages of the council, um, uh, while people on very, very high salaries like the chief executive uh, got a significant increase. I think the difference is very, very clear for people to be able to see. Okay, thank you, for Councillor Van Jackson. Um, I'm going to say... I've indicated um, my like hand to... again, please, Councillor Dowling. Okay, very quickly, Councillor Jones, and then well, I'm going to no, I mean, time you know, I'm, I'm entitled to speak, so um, I didn't realise there was a time cap to this meeting. Um, there was no pay freeze under my administration. We are part of a national joint negotiation for pay increases. Councillor Vernon Jackson is being very, very <coughs> political. He has intimated that we took over £500 of pay away from people who were paid the lowest. What an absolutely abhorrent suggestion for him to make. Yes, he might want to get some political one-upmanship here, but to make a statement like that and say the Conservatives took £500 of pay away from people is wholly inappropriate it is dishonest and it is in fact incorrect um, and as I say we are part of the national joint agreement which he should know having been a political lead on the LGA for such a long time uh, he knows the situation in fact that was a um, position I found myself in as leader of the council which I inherited from him being part of that national joint agreement for pay increases so uh, all I did Councillor Vernon Jackson was continue your um, uh, pay increase uh, process um, and from what I can see, you can make all the noises you like, but your outcome today of this report is going to be no different to what mine was three years ago. Uh, Chair, I, I don't think, yeah, I, it's mainly just a piece of housekeeping, actually. I, I was going to let Councillor Jones respond to Councillor Jackson's suggestion. Um, I wanted to formally second Councillor Jones's proposal that if we are going to do this work, that there is a um, an outcome that can be... Um, discussed at the budget in uh, February next year, so that the, the uh, working group should report back with um, a cost suggestion that should be added to the budget by February next year, and that should be recommendation six. I wanted to formally second Councillor Jones's suggestion on that and, basis, and that's, because, that's very because, because there shouldn't be any dancing around on this issue. No. It's, it's either possible or it's not, and we shouldn't yeah. waste years discussing Yeah, it. no, I completely agree. It's a very sensible suggestion. Um, Councillor Sanders, it's your um, uh, I'm uh, sorry, I was about to, I hate interrupting, uh, but I was about to say that I'd be happy to work with Vicky and Matt on in, in integrating that sort of approach into what I have written. If that is all, I mean, Gerald is happy with it, and I'm happy with it because we need we need to know by when and how, but recognising it isn't going to be done overnight, but recognising the direction of travel of where we want to go, which is which is accreditation. So I'm happy with the substance of what Matt has said. Um, Vicky, it seems there's consensus on, on, on that. Are you happy with what the committee is asking? Um, yes, I mean, basically, um, so the committee thinks it's a sensible way forward is to recommend, um, to add some recommendations. Recommendation five, that a working group is established to see how, and also to establish a timetable uh, for PCC to become a living wage accredited employer and also that as recommendation six um, that the working group is to report back by January in order that it can be part of the yeah. budget 2021. Yeah. And, and to be honest, Vicky, sorry to interrupt Ben, it, it may be that because of the virus, I mean office workers being told to work from home again as of what 12.45 today, it may be that that may become 
may become difficult, but I think an honest analysis is, is helpful because it clearly isn't going to be done straight away. Okay, Councillor Jones. Could you take the two new recommendations separately, Councillor Dowling, because I want to vote for one of them but not the other. Okay, I'm happy to do that. Um, so, firstly, can we take... Are we, is everyone happy to take all the current the on the agenda recommendations as read? Is there any dissent to that? Wonderful. So, as, as written, Vicky. Next uh, uh, additional rep, uh, excuse me additional recommendation that we recommend to cabinet to form a working group to establish the ex, uh, a more accurate cost and a timetable on achieving living wage accreditation uh, with a report detailing it by the end of January 2021. All those in fate, or I think, do we have to do one by one, Vicky? We're tending to do it by exception, that people object um, and every people are silent, it's okay. I'm not I'm not clear, Chair, whether I thought that uh, Councillor Jones wanted the recommendations to be separate. Um, is that Sorry, yeah, so that's the, the one separation. that Councillor Dowling's just read out um, about the creation of a working group. I have no objection to. Agreed. Right. Okay, so I think that's agreed. Yeah. And then the second is I've completely forgot. I'm, my mind's gone blank now. Um, Chair, I think the second, I think the second one was to do with the timetable. No, it's it to do was... with joining. It was the principle of joining the National Living Wage Foundation. Oh, okay. okay. Do you want, so Councillor Jones, do you want to actually say what that recommendation is? No, no, because I'm against it. <laughs> okay. So I'm, I'm slightly confused as to exactly what it is we're voting against or for. So, so can Jones. I give you some words, Ben? Yeah. That the City Council reaffirms its intention to become an accredited living wage foundation employer. Okay. Uh, as this is clearly the controversial one and there's only six of us, I'm going to just call names and if you could say for or against uh, or abstain in um, Councillor Atkins. Uh, abstain. Councillor Jones. Uh, until I know the outcome of the working group numbers, I'm going to abstain on this as well. Councillor Van Jackson. Support. Councillor Sanders. Support. Councillor Corkery. Support. Uh, and I shall abstain as chair. Uh, not that it'll make any difference. So I make that three abstentions, three in support of the recommendation. So that's the, uh, the recommendation passed. Uh, wonderful. I think that brings us to the end of that item, unless there are any final comments um, before we move on. Councillor Jones, you still have your hand raised. Sorry, that's a mistake. Okay. And Councillor Van Jackson, are you leaving us now? I am indeed, I'm sorry to say. No. Thank you for your attendance. I'm sure you'll Enjoy have a fun time you have with Oh, and oh. Cal, congratulations on becoming a student again. Thank you. <laughs> okay, colleagues. Um, moving back to the agenda as previously published, item five, sickness absence. Uh, is this you yourself, Rochelle? Yes, that is. Thank you. Um, so, good news, um, hopefully, for everyone. Um, worldwide pandemic and force of City Council's absence levels are the lowest we've seen in some time, so excellent news. Um, whilst it's too early um, to correlate the decrease in absence levels with the flexible way that we are working, the employee opinion survey and our interactions with staff certainly seem to suggest a correlation. Um, so the average days lost has decreased from 10.01 days per person to 9.33. And just to note, those figures are from the June data. Um, we didn't have a formal committee in June, so the last 
number that you would have seen in this formal committee was 10.91. So the reduction is from 10.91 per person to 9.33 days lost. We have seen a slight increase in um, work-related stress um, and musculoskeletal, which are two areas we focused on quite heavily um, in terms of well-being. We expected to see an increase in work-related stress because as members had requested in a previous committee, we now report those separately. So that category is available where it's never been available before. So again, we need more data to assess whether there's a pattern regarding that, but it is something that we are alert to. 11 of the directorates have seen a decrease in absence levels. The only one that's seen a slight increase is adult social care with the expectation that we would we would anticipate seeing it in that area due to everything that and the conditions and way that they're working at the moment but for everyone else it's positive the only other points to note are um covid 19 reason for absence is listed as 15th in one of our um charts and just to note that you're only recorded as sick and absent due to that reason if you've been confirmed or if you are or before the test was available if you are symptomatic it doesn't include those people who are in quarantine and able to work from home so even if you are symptomatic if you're not sick and you would otherwise be available for work you wouldn't be reported in into that category for anybody um, that we see as confirmed case of covid we make direct contact with the line manager and or individual to verify that as I say, prior to having the test available, we had to take our best guess that that was the correct place to record them, but not everybody is recorded in there. Um, the other area that we focus very heavily on since moving into business critical mode is well-being. I won't run through all of the initiatives because they're outlined in the paper, but we have a special in the know well-being that's sent to all staff and people can access that via their personal devices or via their work email. So we're trying to reach as many people as possible and make that a regular occurrence. The only other anomaly that um, I know people look at these stats very, very uh, closely, there's a section in there called external absence, which I will get removed for next time. Um, the people recorded in that group are workers that need to be put onto the system for IR35 purposes, but we don't pay them. So it doesn't impact on your, in terms of the budget or overall position of the council. Um, so that's all I was going to note for absence, but positive news, we need longer to assess the reasons behind that. We have been led to believe that it could be increased hygiene factors as well. We are all washing our hands and keeping away from one another. Um, so that could also be a reason as well as the way in which we are currently working in large areas of the council. Thanks, Rochelle. Um, colleagues, the, all this report is simply to note, so we can take questions and comments together. Um, and then I suspect we will just approve the recommendations as they are. Any, any comments or questions? Councillor Corkery. Thank you, Chair. Only very briefly, but just to kind of pick up on, uh, I know which which I was already discussed about it being quite a kind of remarkable and surprising um, result that sickness overall is down. Um, and really to kind of, I guess, emphasise and reflect on um, some of the reasons why that may be in terms of increased flexibility um, and increased kind of power that people have got over their time and how they're spending it. Um, and clearly that, well, it would appear that that has had significant improvement to some people's health. I know, I know it doesn't um, work for everybody and there are also some disadvantages to it, but hopefully that's a kind of major piece of learning that we can take away longer term as part of a wider review into how council staff are managed and how they're able to manage their own time, et cetera. Okay, thank you, Councillor Corkery. Councillor Atkins? Yeah, I just wanted to, to echo the fact that it's pleasing that um, sickness has gone down in most departments and, and actually it's, it's gone up a bit in, in adult care. That is perhaps understandable given that their jobs have arguably been higher stress during the, um, the COVID pandemic. Um, but, but it is still at a high level and, and hopefully we can continue to work in that department to bring that down. Um, I just wanted to say as well that, that, that it is also, it is interesting that sickness has dropped during the uh, the pandemic crisis and, and it may be worth the council exploring the way in which flexibility and home working has contributed to that. We do also have to recognise that some departments, um, not all of them, but some of them have, have got into significant work backlogs during the COVID pandemic, some of that because of extra work that needed to be done, but there may also be an element of the flexibility and home working not currently being as efficient given the council setup. So while also recognising that flexibility may have contributed to better health outcomes for our staff, we do need to make sure that um, 
that the the work is being fully completed as well because there are backlogs in some departments uh, that are going to need to be resolved at, at some point. Um, but uh, thank you for the report. Um, largely encouraging news. So. Thank you, Councillor Atkins. Unless there are no other comments, um, I think. Um, are there any? Is there any dissent to the recommendations for noting as published? Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. We will uh, move on in that case. Um, item six: reward and recognition. Um, if the officer presenting could do so, and then we'll hear the uh, deputation in reference to this item. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so reward and recognition, this is something that we've given much thought and consideration to, and it's certainly something that we've been discussing on a regular basis with our trade union um, colleagues, and it was raised by them some time ago. Um, we've seen, it's without a doubt, we've seen a positive contribution and response from our staff and the wider community in relation to the pandemic. It's for that reason that we are recommending that a, an award ceremony is held when it is safe to do so, to recognise um, the city's contribution as well as the city council, so a much wider community-based um, feeling in our approach. It's a really positive opportunity for us to try and embed recognition as a norm within the city council and it's a real opportunity to, to do so. Um, we would recommend this and we've given, we would suggest that we give all the thought and prepare for that occasion now, but we don't obviously act until public health give us the nod and I'm suspecting that's probably when there's going to be either a vaccine available or at least some clinical um, advancements from where we are now to show that that's safe to do so. When we've been preparing this report, it's obviously been prudent for us to take into account the council's financial position in terms of the income that we've lost along the way and to not make recommendations of a financial matter that would be potentially unaffordable. Our other considerations are also based on the decisions that have already been made within the council. So, for example, where we have gone above and beyond the minimums that the government um, said we were able to do so. Examples are the furlough scheme, where we were able to furlough some staff we decided and chose to pay as a city council 100% of wages so nobody was at a loss instead of the 80% which was a, a possibility. Where staff have needed to quarantine or whether, where they've been in sh shielded, we have also made sure that those staff have had no financial detriment at all during that time because we want to make sure our staff are protected and make sure that we're not encouraging people to attend work when they perhaps aren't well enough to do so but have a financial overhead hanging over them. So we've made those decisions. The other and probably final consideration that we've taken into account is our partnership and joint working with other authorities. Um, for example, the NHS. So we've been working with the LGA and NHS to understand what they have been doing. And there's been much discussion around financial rewards, but little activity at the moment. So we didn't feel that it was appropriate for us to recommend that when our partners weren't doing so. And we were conscious of the potential public perception of us as a local authority versus the NHS. So those were all the thoughts and considerations. That's how we came to our recommendation. So happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Rochelle. I, I know I've got some comments and queries and, and thoughts on this, um, oh. but I'll go to others first. Councillor Sanders? Chair, oh, sorry, there's a deputation. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. apologies, apologies, okay. entirely my fault. I got too excited about talking about reward and recognition. Um, and I'm happy to wait, I don't Vicky. Mind. Okay, right, deputation on behalf of Unite the Unions. Item six, reward and recognition. Unite is in support of a comprehensive reward and recognition scheme in Portsmouth City Council. We also believe that there is a need to recognise the hard work and sacrifice staff have made during the ongoing pandemic. The report today seems to treat these matters as one and the same, but we feel they are distinct issues that need to be looked separately, particularly due to the exceptional time we currently find ourselves in. UNITE represents members all over PCC from green and clean, schools and social care to parking and the port. Our members have worked tirelessly in extremely difficult circumstances to provide services and support to the people of Portsmouth throughout the pandemic. We know this work is valued by you and the communities PCC serves. We stood on doorsteps to capture carers and key workers every Thursday and we feel it's now time to really reward those that have worked throughout this entire pandemic on the front line through a very difficult and dangerous period by way of an unconsolidated COVID bonus. 
Unite and other unions have been successful in securing similar payments with other authorities in the local area. Most recently, a £300 bonus payment was agreed with Chess Valley District Council. We would like to begin discussions with BCC around a bonus for frontline staff. We understand the current financial predicament local authorities find themselves in, but we feel a bonus could be funded in part by the redistribution of the job retention bonus, which will see businesses receive a one-off payment of £1,000 for every previously furloughed employee if they are still employed at the end of January next year. Outside these exceptional times, we support the introduction of a reward and recognition scheme, and we would expect the detail of such a scheme to be agreed in conjunction with the joint unions. Okay, thank you for that, Vicky. Um, we'll go with Councillor Sanders and then Councillor Jones. Councillor Sanders. Thanks, Ben. Um, a couple of questions and then I have some observations. Um, the questions are mainly to David, really. Um, the first is around the deputation's suggestion of recycling some of the job retention bonus um, to our employees. Is, is that possible? Is that something that can be done? How much of it will happen? Because if, it's, if we've only got £1,000 left, that's a waste of time. Yeah, I don't have the figure uh, to hand, Chairman, um, but I think there would be difficulties in doing that. I think clearly we would have to investigate in greater detail um, any other schemes that the unions are aware of where that has been done and has been approved through the financial restrictions on any of that, on any of that funding. Um, happy to come back to that if that would help. No, that 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 that's fine, David. Um, I mean, I I'm I'm a great believer in rewarding the people who've done the work um, with regards to COVID. And if that and, and I've said in council, if that means smashing historic differentials, that means smashing historic differentials, which I know is always difficult. Um, but what's the situation with regards to things like honorarium payments and all those sorts of things in the council? Is that doable, workable? I don't know. Well, there are a number of issues here, really. Um, it doesn't suit our honoraria scheme. Our honoraria scheme is not designed for um, the situation we find ourselves in with COVID. And if I may, Chairman, what I, um, what I would like to say in, in response to the deputation is, you know, huge appreciation to our staff and those union members for the tremendous effort that has gone in and has gone in to date. The, the, the level of commitment from the staff across the council has been absolutely um, phenomenal. But as soon as you start trying to differentiate in terms of which staff do you give additional reward to and which not, the deputation, for example, referred to frontline staff, you know, without the added hours and effort and all the rest of it that all those other staff put in, the frontline staff would not have been able to operate um, in the way in which they did. So, so it, it is incredibly invidious um, to try to select um, who should uh, receive reward and who shouldn't. Um, I'm hugely proud of all the work that the staff have done, but I'm not sure that trying to differentiate in that manner is uh, necessarily going to help things because the staff themselves recognise that they operate as multidisciplinary teams and that they're all interdependent in terms of their activity. Um, I think the other thing, the other issue that we've got, and you know, today of all days demonstrates that, is that we are by no means anywhere near the end of this. Um, and I think we need to be extremely wary about making judgments and creating precedents um, at this stage. I'm happy to come back and answer any other questions members may have. Um, just to come back on that, Ben, if I may, I personally I would agree. Yeah. Um, I, 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 th I think this is a bit like sort of saying, well, you know, we're going to reward people after Dunkirk uh, rather than VE Day. Um, and, and I think we really do have to. And I'm worried, Rochelle, about recommendation three, which is that the award ceremony will be done when the vaccine is made available. Because at the moment, it looks like a vaccine may be made available for 5%, 3%, 5% of the population. That's coming out of the CDC, certainly in the States. Um, and that, then people go, oh, it's made available. I can get it. Therefore... Um, so I, I think we, I think that, I mean, I, I understand the sentiments behind this, but I think this is a bit early, personally. 
Um, if colleagues want to go ahead with it, I won't stop them. But I, I do think this is a bit early, and we've got to wait for everything to come through. Um, that that would that would be that would be my own personal opinion. Um, but I think it's a bit too early, um, to be honest. Um, I would agree with David um, on on other points, um, and um, I, I wait to see what other colleagues say. Thank you, Councillor Sanders. Um, Rochelle, I can see you want to come back on some of that, so I'll let you do so. Yeah, that was just to say, I, I completely agree with the timing issue. We were asked to table a, a report for today's meeting, and that's what we've done. And the third recommendation, I would completely agree that that situation has evolved, and we've learnt more since writing the report. Um, so it would need to be available in a capacity that made the, the ceremony safe as yeah. such. That's, that's and, the and sorry, that I Ben, I, I, for, I forgot to point out here. Also, Council has agreed to have uh, an independently judged coronavirus civic award for next May, ideally, um, although um, that may change as the virus may change, to be honest, because I think none of us at the, that meeting actually thought that this would continue on for six months and restrictions will continue for six months. So there is that as well. And I think one of the other issues about doing it this way is who judges it, um, because we want to make sure it's as independent as possible. So I'll just throw that in. but I. I think it's a tad too early, but I will listen to the many colleagues who've put their hands up. Thank you, Councillor Sanders. I'm, I'll make my point very quickly. I, I think award ceremonies in general are highly flawed in their logic um, and don't necessarily result in, in the intended outcomes, but I'll be keen to hear what others think. Um, Councillor Jones, I believe you were next. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, just to follow on from Councillor Sanders' point, first of all, um, I think he was recommending to remove the when the vaccination becomes available uh, and just to alter that to when it's safe to do so, as in hold the award ceremony. And if that is the basis, I'd be quite happy to second that proposal. Um, my own personal opinion is that... Um, yeah, I mean, there are parts of the public sector that get lots of adulation, and we've obviously seen that with uh, the NHS, and we, you know, we see it with teachers, and we see it with some, sometimes with the police, you know, um, but actually not very often with council staff. And if you think about the breadth of the services that are delivered by councils, um, it is it is phenomenal, actually, um, and. I think as an organisation we've probably learnt uh, and grown so much throughout this process. Um, clearly for some people their jobs transfer to being able to do them at home fairly easily um, and for others they really don't. Um, so some people as we know in the organisation have Caroline Hopper for one completely stopped doing the job she was doing and she's now got skills and is doing things in, in the planning regeneration economic development area of the council that she'd never done before so she will come out of this with skills and she's also demonstrated that she's been able to adapt which is you know good for her um, so there are some great examples and I think that it's it's whether it's an award ceremony. I mean, I I I don't feel particularly strongly. Whatever the count, you know, whatever we decide as a collective, is the best way to acknowledge people. Um, but I know that when. I was leader of the council. It was something that I was keen to do when it was appropriate. Um, and I introduced a reward scheme for people to recommend, you know, suggestions to us of ways the council could improve, for example. And the way I said thank you when they did that was to pay them a £25. Um, they could either have it as a voucher or if it went into their pay. Sean might be able to confirm this. But anyway, it came out of the leader's initiative budget. That's how I funded it. Um, or they could pick to have an additional day's annual leave. So it was up to them, really. They could they could choose to either take a financial incentive, which was a set amount, regardless of what band they were on, as I say, or a bit of extra time, particularly those people that have got children. That for them was more valuable than a twenty-five pounds extra in their in their pay. Um, so that's why we did that and we asked for feedback from the staff before we chose what the two things were we also hosted things obviously with the Lord Mayor as you know that we do do when people are leaving our employment if they've worked for us for over sort of 25-30 years um, and through the leaders thank you dinner that I, it, that I introduced in the March each year um, we sort of you know invited staff to come along who maybe David or a director had indicated to me had done an exceptional job or um, had coped with a very difficult situation and actually sometimes just going and speaking to a member of staff writing them a personal letter um, as we all know as councillors 
can be more than you would give them in a financial amount of money anyway. So I think it's a really nice thing for us to think about, whether it's just an award ceremony or whether it, we have a package of things or whether because the award ceremony could be challenging because of COVID, we look at, you know, doing a day's annual leave or we do sort of some sort of financial initiative if the leader's budget could still cover that. I don't know what it is at the moment, how much is in that. But I think there are a number of ways that we could do this and I, and I support the concept. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Uh, Rochelle, is it on this point? Yes, only, only one matter. I don't I, I agree with everything Councillor Jones has just said. The, the only reason I should have said in my opening part that we didn't suggest annual leave is because it's a bit of a sensitive subject in some areas because people haven't been able to take it and the government have extended the period of time to allow us to carry over. So I, again, I didn't want to put something quite emotive in the report that so potentially giving someone leave that they might not be able to take for three years. That's not across the board, um, but just in certain areas. But yes, a similar sort of entitlement would be a sense. Thank you both. Uh, Councillor Corkery, and then I have a few comments. Thank you, Chair. In terms of the bonus, I guess I just want to reflect on a little bit the discussion about whether something could potentially be targeted at specific groups of staff or whether it would have to be kind of universal across the boards um, recognise the fact that people have contributed in different ways. I'm not sure I've got a firm position on that, but I do think it is worth reflecting on the fact that there will, there is a percentage of council staff and I don't know how big that percentage is, but there are people basically that were out there kind of in the community on the front line at the real height of this, um, whether it's community wardens for example or state service offer etc people that weren't able to work from home um, and had to in order to fulfill their duties put themselves on the front line potentially at risk um, and I do think that's worth reflecting on when we're thinking about uh, the potential for a targeted um, bonus support and obviously that would then kind of make that much more affordable potentially if we were looking at specific groups although of course I appreciate the fact that there's lots of people that one in, in that position that was still under massive amounts of stress and added pressure and all the rest of it. So it, it's not an easy um, thing by all means, but I just think it's worth thinking about. And in terms of uh, the, the recognition awards, I kind of feel less strongly about this, um, but a suggestion maybe to look at some kind of virtual or online event that can still take place over the next couple of months when we are going to be in some form of lockdown by, by all means. But it may just be something that is a bit of a morale booster that isn't too resource intensive. Um, but it's just something that kind of goes that way. And I think the council's got a lot better at this recently of doing stuff online. And the example I'd pick up that I um, was watching the other day is the, the Heritage Open Days that were live streamed on Facebook. That I, I thought that I mean, was a really good, innovative use of social media that probably wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for lockdown. But the fact that they are now happening that way, I'll bet 10 times more, if not more, people are actually watching and engaging with it. Um, so yeah, just another idea to put out there and maybe we could do something virtually rather than meeting in person. Thank you, <coughs> Councillor. Um, before I come to others, um, I'll just have a few comments. Um, I think there's actually three things we're talking about here. Um, and I think they are in ways quite distinct of each other. The first is, reward and recognition across the council in general. I think there is how do we recognise individuals or teams who have gone above and beyond in the current circumstances and then there is also something which something Councillor Jones said really prompted what I, uh, my line of thinking on this which is how can we publicly celebrate not necessarily individual council staff but the, the actions and the services that the council does um, in, a, in a public way, uh, particularly in the current circumstances. Um, and I think what Councillor Jones said really rung true with me, because I absolutely agree that as a council, we do an awful lot for the public um, and the services that, that we provide as a council are not recognised in the way that, you know, NHS services, police services, teachers, etc. And that's not to denigrate any of those because you can celebrate one thing without denigrating other things. But um, I do wonder if there's a comms piece there um, more broadly on, on that particular topic. In relation to the recommendations as they are, um, I, I'll be honest, I worry about an awards ceremony and it's kind of 
most kind of basic general form. Um, I think there's an awful lot of room for disappointment, a lot of room for favoritism, a lot of room for who decides on what. Um, is it just the most popular person in the department that then gets the reward because everyone nominates the same person, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they're just riddled with it. And we see it in public circumstances, um, whether it's in celebrity culture, BAFTAs, TV, et cetera, or even just really low level stuff in the community. We see it all the time. Um, and I, all right, so so the concept of an award ceremony does worry me, and I would personally, and I'll be guided by others in the committee as well, but I wouldn't go with the recommendations as written. Um, I would like to see a recommendation that looks something along the lines of uh, uh, aligning to those three things I've just mentioned. So uh, recommending to whoever, probably cabinet again, uh, or the chief exec or whoever, the, that a, uh, an, a concerted effort goes into the comms around celebrating the, the council's contribution to the community. Uh, so that would be one. The second one would be to review PCC's reward and recognition processes as a whole. And then the third would be to um, review other ways in which um, reward and recognition can happen in relation to individual and team contributions toward the current pandemic. Um, I also completely agree with some of the previous comments about kind of cart before horse. We're on an ongoing thing here. Um, and in a way, we, because it's such an ongoing thing, we do need to kind of take a minute to recognize people. But at the same time, it can't be a grand award ceremony where we celebrate as if everything's hunky dory and say well done to everyone because I don't think that works. Um, so I'd be open to seconders on those three things, um, but I'm keen to hear what others have to say. As I can see, Councillor Sanders and Jones still need to have some input. Councillor Sanders. My input was purely to second your suggestion, Ben. Um, I think it's eminently sensible. Um, I, think, I think a lot of time life effort has been put into the how, but we've still got a lot of how to go. We've got a series of restrictions that are now going to last six months. Uh, they're almost certainly going to be tighter because people, many people will just ignore them. Uh, we've got lots of office workers who now have to work from home, and that's going to have an effect on the staff at the civic offices, housing offices, and on the front line as well. And also there's an issue about who we, who we award to. Do we award, can, do we award housing contractors who have been working on how we in-house to provide housing for our homeless, for instance, during the lockdown? Um, I would argue yes, but I might be biased. So I think there's, there's a lot of things we can do, but I, 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 I agree that with those three things. The only thing I would add, which is the thing Donna raised earlier, is around doing anything when it's safe to do so. And I think that's eminently sensible. Um, uh, but yeah, I agree with your, provided we put the word safe to do so in there somewhere, um, then I would agree with your three recommendations, Ben. Thank you, Councillor Sanders. So I think that's the second of those three items, which is very helpful. Um, Councillor Atkins. Um, I think I, I would just speak up uh, briefly in defence of the the award ceremony idea. I mean, I agree that it is a um, it can these things can become um, biased or partisan, but I don't think they necessarily have to be. So I, I just think perhaps I would leave that recommendation there. Um, if we wanted, we could bolster it with some sort of wording around. Um, uh, more thought or report going into the criteria and, and the selection process. Um, I think if it's going to be um, absorbable at a relatively low cost, it is still something that um, I think could be positive for staff um, and, and can hold up good like examples of really good practice. And I think I think holding up examples of staff who do adopt really good practice and do something special or unusual or above and beyond, I, I think that is a potentially worthwhile. Um, thing to do, um, recognizing individuals for uh, spectacular or, or uh, unusual individual contribution is a valuable thing to do, um, whether through a, an awards area or another method, and, and certainly thought has to go into the selection criteria, but but I do think um, there is value in that recommendation as well, um, so I wouldn't want to dispense with it particularly. Uh, Councillor Atkins, I'm quite keen to get some consensus on the way forward and actually I don't disagree with what you've said either um, would you be willing to support a recommendation that is around you know, further investigation looking at all the options not dis not dismissing the award ceremony as part of those options 
Um, I'm just conscious. I, I'm not convinced, and especially having heard people's contributions, that committing the council to an award ceremony today as the employment committee is the right way forward. How do you think, feel Ben? That's that? sorry, sorry, Matt. I think Ben, that Ben, that's just a fourth little line that we can add, essentially, which is to explore other options and all that sort of stuff. I'm getting some head nodding, Councillor Atkins. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, Vicky, I think there's some, so three things there. Um, a recommendation to whoever it needs to re be recommended to to look at how the council celebrates publicly the services and the efforts that council officers go to. Something, um, a report to the next employment committee colleagues on reward and recognition as a whole across BCC and the systems we have in place uh, um, would be very good. And then finally. Um, further investigation into a variety of options for reward and recognition in relation to efforts during the pandemic and relating to the pandemic. Uh, not, uh, not, uh, what's not coming the word now? Not completely disowning the idea of a an, an award ceremony. So including the possibility of an award ceremony. Perhaps not discounting. Thank you. Discounting. Vicky, you are wonderful. That's the word. Um, thank you, colleagues. I think that all makes sense. Uh, let's move on. Item seven, health and safety information report. Thank you, Chair. That's gonna, I'm going yes. to lead that if I can, uh, Councillor Dowling. Thank you. Um, the, the report we've got in front of us is the annual report update. Uh, to the Employment Committee on PCC's uh, health and safety performance for the period uh, 1st of April 2019 to the 31st of March 2020. Um, the, the key recommendations are two recommendations. One is um, that the corporate plan for this, this year we're in now, 2020-21, is noted and that the, uh, to note the appointment of the new health and safety manager and to endorse the opportunity for the manager to review the annual um, health and safety report and requirements for um, employment committee and to perhaps um, enhance the report moving forward to um, include for uh, more items around health and safety, um, but also to take on board you know, the learnings from uh, the COVID-19 and the pandemic as well. Um, before, before we go into the, the main retort, report, Chair, I'd like to um, publicly, publicly thank the health and safety team, the corporate health and safety team, if I may, um, for the work they've done over the last 18 months. Um, they've embraced, embraced a significant number of new challenges um, of what's, what's been thrown at us, and um, I'm very grateful for the work they've done, um, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, thankful for what they've uh, delivered over the past 18 months. Uh, I would also like to take this opportunity to introduce Katie Bale, who's our new health and safety manager. Uh, Katie took up her appointment on the 8th of September and uh, as she's only been here for three weeks I thought it uh, I, I didn't want to load her on with uh, presenting this report in her third week so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to uh, for Katie to join the organisation uh, and to help us move uh, health and safety and promote health and safety across the organisation. Um, the, the key areas of performance in, in 1920 uh, really covered by, by about six or seven points which I've highlighted in the report. Uh, we continue to actively engage with the health and safety executive um, and that's in various unannounced site visits, um, inspections they carry out, there's a variety of interventions they carry out with us um, and all of those interventions we, we, we received favourable outcomes which highlighted the, you know, the, the continuing high standard uh, and seriousness that PCC takes with regard to health and safety. Uh, we, we received no statutory enforcement notices during the reporting period, no significant asbestos management failings and ditto the same about Leeds Janella. Um, and finally, uh, although the COVID-19 pandemic um, brought a new s challenges to the team, at, at right at the tail end of the reporting period, um, you know, the, the team has embraced that and engaged proactively with uh, numerous internal and external stakeholders. They continue to do that and have supported numerous um, services, both internally and externally from the council in terms of making them fit for purpose uh, and enabling them to then um, uh, stand back up as uh, as uh, the lockdown has been eased, etc. So, uh, 
um, the, 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 the work around that continues and I think we'll cover that more in the report that I'll bring to you uh, next year. Uh, the appendices are one and two. Uh, number one um, uh, summarises the, um, the work that we've undertaken during the period of 1920 um, and the actions uh, undertaken and the appendix two at the back of the document contains the action plan for the team of 2021. Um, the majority of uh, the action plan was put together by um, the team uh, prior to Katie starting and, uh, and one of the things that uh, part of Katie's work will be re to review that, uh, take that work as, as our business as usual um, uh, de delivery of the service uh, but then also to add her own um, uh, impact and her own uh, observations and add to that as we go forward and that will be part of um, perhaps a, a new version of the report that we'll, we'll come back to um, Employment Committee uh, at this time next year. Um, I'm happy to take any questions um, from that point, um, Councillor Dowling. Thank you very much. Um, members, any questions or comments? Councillor Corkery. Thank you. I was just curious to ask, Meredith, what the involvement, if any, of the trade unions um, in terms of working with the Council on health and safety issues there is? Okay. Thank you, Councillor Corkery. Um, within the, um, the communication section of the report, we, I, I mentioned that we have, uh, pr prior, prior to the COVID um, pandemic starting, we, we engaged with the unions as part of the Joint Health and Safety and Wellbeing um, Forum. So we, we met with all the um, uh, trade unions on a quarterly basis. Since the pandemic started, I've chaired uh, firstly a weekly, then fortnightly meeting, and now it's the, um, the frequency has gone out to a monthly meeting with um, the trade unions, health and safety facilities, and our own health and uh, our own human resources team, where we um, up update all parties in terms of the work that's going on, issues we're facing, feedback from staff, etc. But also sharing uh, some of the plans and the, and the work that's being put in place as we continue. So, you know, the, the, I think it was John Woods from Unison mentioned at one of the previous meetings the the working relationship between health and safety facilities, HR, and the unions is in a really great position. Um, and uh, you know, we, we we intend to build on that. And as part as part of Katie's um, uh, induction, she's got um, uh, in, induction meetings with all the trade unions to help us continue with that good work that's continued to date. That's good to hear. Thank you, Meredith. And I think it's worth highlighting that as another example of the kind of productive and helpful role that unions can play in the good governance of local authorities. Um, and it's also obviously another, another forum in which staff can raise concerns, complaints with regards to health and safety, um, which is only going to become more important as the pandemic goes on. Thank you. Rochelle, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, it was only to add that from a, a local level, feeding out from that meeting, um, which which I do attend, um, the unions have been involved. We've produced a lot of interim guidance because of the way that we're working at the moment in terms of return to work. So when people are going back to work, even if that's working from home or in a different place, unions have been um, fully involved in all of those um, arrangements today and giving their comments and feedback into those meetings. So it's one that I think is working really well at the moment in terms of engagement and moving issues on. That includes all of the risk assessments as well, of which there have been many um, from start to now. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Councillor Jones. Uh, thank you, Meredith, for the presentation. Um, I really just wanted to say hello and welcome to Katie, really. Um, if you've been watching the whole meeting, um, it's not normally as, you know, angsty as this, I will say that. Um, and also, what a time to be introducing the health and safety uh, team corporate plan three weeks after you started. That's a baptism of fire, especially during a pandemic. But um, anyway, uh, welcome to the organisation, and I hope that we have no events and everything goes really well in your area, because that means that <laughs> everything everyone is safe okay thank you members and i'd uh, echo councillor jones's uh, welcome to katie um so uh, i believe we're just noting um that's correct. these that's correct, yeah. items thank you uh, unless there are any other questions or queries i'm going to take them as read yeah wonderful thank you everyone and then to our final agenda item the employee opinion survey Chair, I'm really sorry. I'm going to have to go. I need to be somewhere in 25 minutes and I've got to drive there. So I'm going to have to say goodbye.
Apologies. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Um, are we Hi. still core at Vicky? Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Thanks, Donna. Quorum quorum's two for this committee chair. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Cal, Matt, and Darren. Let's let's see if we can make it to the end of the meeting. Um, <laughs> employee opinion survey. Um, is this yourself, Michelle, again? Uh, no, it's no. me. Natasha. Yeah, it's Thank Natasha. you. Thank you. Um, thanks very much. Um, so we wouldn't normally be um, talking to an employment committee about uh, an opinion survey at this point because at the last meeting in March we said we'd move to running the survey once every two years uh, for various reasons. However, times have changed and we did do an employee opinion survey to understand from our staff their views on how as a city council we have been responding to uh, the, the pandemic. Um, so hence the report to you here today. Um, I think the first thing to say is that there was uh, probably one of the highest response rates we've seen in many years to this particular survey, 56% uh, uh, response rate that compares with 49% in previous years. Um, so we did have quite a good representation of staff views in that. I think the other thing to say is that because of the nature of the survey, it wasn't one where we've asked an awful lot of similar questions because they were specific to the council's coronavirus response. But what we do know is that there's a very high level of engagement amongst our staff where 81% of those who responded reported feeling extremely proud to work for the council. That compares with 75% last year. Um, so overall, the survey findings were that you know staff feel the councillors' response responded well. Um, there's a high degree of confidence and leadership at all levels across the organisation. Um, a significant proportion of those who responded are working from home, but we did also get responses from people who are working at their usual place of work. So that could be um, a residential care home, it could be um, a library, it could be in, in, in parks and outdoor spaces. So there was a, a, a decent cross-section from different settings. Um, but what is good to see is that across all of the different work settings that people are working in, they very much feel supported um, to do their work. They are reporting good productivity, good contact with line managers, uh, clarity around what is expected uh, of them with, with clear work directions. Um, and, and we did ask around what are some of the inhibitors to productivity, and they are largely about things that we are already taking steps to address and were at the time of the survey. So the technology to enable the kind of thing we're doing right now in terms of remote working, working from home, the provision of equipment such as additional screens, monitors, keyboards, um, chairs for you know, um, safe musculoskeletal working when people are working from home. Um, there were reported anxiety levels related to the pandemic. I think that's that's normal and something we're seeing across the population. Um, and in some areas, changes to working practices that we've had to introduce to continue to deliver services. Um, but the responses are very, very positive um, in terms of staff responding and, and the, how staff are feeling around how we're supporting them to enable them to continue delivering vital services to residents. The final section of the survey asked staff what they felt the council should be focusing on moving forward. Um, the, the, the main responses fell into the categories of resident safety, um, particularly those who are most vulnerable. Um, staff safety, um, and we have had a big focus on that through the work Meredith is leading um, and working collaboratively with unions um, to, to have safe working practices, risk assessments, etc. A clear desire from staff to maintain key services to residents and this isn't just about delivering the service it's also about maintaining the quality and the level of service that residents can can expect from us um, and flexibility so enabling staff to have flexibility around working from home working hours to make sure that they can um, uh, deal with their their home life and caring commitments uh, whilst also carrying on doing their work. And I think this is also uh, speaks to the correlation Rochelle was talking about around reductions in absence levels um, and, and general improvements in staff well-being. 
So in terms of going forward then, um, in response to that survey, but also some of the recent developments uh, that we've seen coming from government guidance, we are now putting um, a working group together to look at what the future might look like. Uh, we already have a number of measures in place in our offices where we've increased cleaning regimes, we've got one-way systems in place, we've made changes to our ventilation systems to increase airflow um, and, and encouraging staff to work remotely where they are able to do so. That working group is now um, going to focus more on the longer term future rather than the immediate safety requirements that we have um, and that's going to look at the technology and what more technology we can roll out to support collaborative working in a in a remote way looking at our uh, all of our premises across the city not just the civic offices in terms of what uh, changes we might need to make to some of those premises um, to support some of the positives uh, that we've learnt from this way of working um, and to look at what impact there has been on services and service delivery and what that might mean for the future. So a, a, a team are coming together to do that work uh, with a view to developing a uh, business case um, around what, what the future working world might look like for the City Council. Um, and uh, we'll stop there and pause for questions. Thank you. Sorry, I mean, the whole meeting uh, without making that mistake got to the final agenda item. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, thank you, Natasha. Um, members, any comments? I can see Councillor Sanders. That was 102 minutes, Ben. That's excellent going uh, before the mute problem occurred, so that's great. Um, I'm, I, the, I'm not going to ask any questions because I'm just beyond impressed, really. I mean, I'm, I'm the, the pensioner in terms of this committee, in terms of what's left. And these are the highest numbers I've seen in a long while um, in terms of positivity towards the council. I mean, over 70% reporting confidence in leadership at all levels. I've not seen those stats for a long while. Um, and and it is highly, highly impressive. And I, and I think what the hidden triumph, I think, is that people, the pandemic has forced everybody at all levels to work together. Um, as Cal said earlier, our relationship with the unions is, is or the, the, the council's relationship with the unions is probably its best ever. Um, in terms of actually productive working and regular working and regular interaction. That's crucial if we're going to get um, a better workplace. Um, I oversee the landlord's maintenance budget, so a fair few things I'm, I'm looking at in this, this survey with some interest, I tell you. And we need to make sure the civic offices is a better working environment. I think it's not been that way for years, um, and we're working on that. Um, I note the interest with, with IT, uh, and certainly in the early days of the pandemic, that was incredibly difficult uh, and that's why it was good that this administration supported by the full all councillors uh, invested millions of pounds in improving the IT uh, which occurred before the pandemic but I think was a, um, a decision with some foresight uh, and is now and is now bearing fruit I think so a highly highly impressive uh, I look forward to Merith and the team actually coming to me with some ideas on practically how to do that but obviously we've got the next stage, which is six months of everybody in an office being told to work from home, which has, in, which has real impact, as both Cal and Donna have outlined throughout this meeting. Um, and we've got to work on that and work on whatever is forwards. But I think we've got an incredibly productive environment. Uh, we've got staff who are motivated at all levels to do the best for our city. Um, and this survey is, is quite stunning and a stunning endorsement of that. And I'm, I'm, I'm mildly impressed. Thank you, Councillor Sanders. Uh, any other comments or queries? In which case, I believe that brings us to the end of our meeting. Uh, thank you very much for everyone's attendance and attention. I look forward to our next meeting. Thank you, Chairman. <laughs>